check in right now, check in right now on Facebook, on social media, and make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you. Ever when I have preached to adults, have I had coffee beforehand? much less the espresso that I had this morning, too. So it's going to be fun. You have two things going for you. I'm, you can look at your spouse or the person with you and say, it's the kids, Pastor. We'll be out of here early. But we'll be out of here extra early, maybe because of the espresso. Um, so in kids' church, one of my favorite things, I, I don't have a joke for you. I'm not funny like, like our lead pastor and Pastor Jen, but I do want to tell you something. In kids' church, um, in the summer, we do all kinds of fun, fun things, right? So we do, like, Nerf Wars, and we do VBS, and we do sometimes sports camp and fine arts camp, and we do all these things, and we just keep them going all summer, all summer, talking about Jesus and having so much fun and praying, but we're having so much fun, right? But then August comes, and it, like, slows a little bit down um, at the end of August, and so... I was in class, and it was the end of August, and all the really fun stuff was done, okay? And I thought, oh, this is going to be okay. The kids are going to still respond to me. And I'm sitting in, the, in a prayer circle with them, and little Isaac Kelly, he raises his hand. He goes, excuse me, Pastor Tracy. I'm like, yes, Isaac. Is all we're going to do is talk about Jesus? I was like, yeah, that's all we're going to do today. We're just, so all, I'm excited to be with adults because all we're going to do is talk about Jesus. We're not going to have a Nerf war. We're just going to talk about Jesus, and I am here for it. I love it. I am prepared, but sometimes in life, we are unprepared for things, right? So when I think back in my life, something that I was very unprepared for was the very first time that I went to CrossFit. Anybody ever done CrossFit? Okay, so I thought that I might be prepared, but I just kind of showed up, and um, there was um, some vomiting. There was some, it's okay, you can do it, get back up, it's okay. There was sweating. It was, it was almost like a whole cardiac event, but I was very unprepared for CrossFit. And in life, we have a definition for unprepared. Thank you, Kane, for doing our media. Nate on the camera. Mark, it looks like he's back there, and Michael. So unprepared means not ready, not able to deal with something. And I was definitely unprepared in CrossFit. But in life, things that can happen that we are unprepared for. Sometimes it is um, a death in the family. Sometimes it is a disease, a diagnosis. Sometimes it's um, a failing marriage. All these kinds of things can happen, and we're just, we're not prepared. It wasn't, it wasn't on our planning list. You know, I know Pastor Jen is a big planner. She, she was already yesterday talking about her planner for 2023, and I'm like, what? We're still in 2022 in October. She's like, but it's time. The new ones are out. And I'm like, I'm just not a planner. It makes me anxious, but I like to be prepared. But sometimes when we're not prepared, we can kind of fall into this pit, right? And when we fall into this pit, with, the, with all of our circumstances, we can get buried, right? And we have a definition for buried, too. Thank you, Cain. Placed or hidden underground, covered up or repressed, right? And so when we get buried, we can be us burying our emotions, our responses to something. It can be, it just gets repressed. We just cover it up and we cover it up and then we're barely breathing there under the ground. We're just, we're just there and we're buried and we're barely, barely breathing. But in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it gives me some hope. It gives me some hope. Paul said, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. So my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Come on now. All the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So Paul was given this thorn in his flesh, right? He was, he was Paul. He wrote a lot of the New Testament, but he was still given this thorn in his flesh. He received revelations from God. He audibly heard God speak. He's seen the third heavens. He is Paul, right? And he still gets a thorn in his flesh. He still has something that he needs God's help with, right? And don't we all, we all have something that we need God's help with, and there's no shame in that. 
But if we look back just one more, just go back to 2 Corinthians 12, 8, Cain. Right. Three times Paul begged for the Lord to take it away from him. Then he said to him, God said to him, he said no. He said no. He said my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. He said no. He said you're going to have to lean on me, Paul. You're going to have to depend on me. Turn to me. Let me work through you. And those things, those things, that, that thorn in your side, that thorn in your flesh is not going to bury you if you lean on me. But if you do not lean on him, you are going to drown in the pit. Sometimes no, as in this case, is also an answer. No also means I love you right? So if you have kids or grandkids and you, um, they ask for ice cream for breakfast in the morning with a piece of cake and you tell them no, does that mean you don't love them? No, it means you want what is best for them, right? It means uh, none of this means God doesn't love us. Suffering um, doesn't mean God doesn't love his people. Us telling our kids no, it makes them sad and they, you know, they cry and sometimes, you know, that you might have to give them a time out, but that doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means no. No is an answer. The difference is between us, between Christians, is suffering, our suffering does something a little different. It showcases God's resources, right? God does not say you won't suffer. No, you will suffer. You will suffer. It is part of it. Are we still sinners? Yes. Are Christians still addicts? Yes. Do Christians still struggle in marriage? Yes. Are we liars? Sometimes cheaters? Um, sometimes we suffer from diseases, mental illness? Yes. The suffering continues. But God uses all of that to show the non-believers the peace and the love they are missing out on if they don't lean on him. And they stay down there in that pit. So if you're a Christian and you're in here this morning, I want to tell you, Christian, come up out of that pit. Come up out of that pit and lean on God. Don't throw a fit. Don't pout because it didn't go your way. Don't throw in the towel to what God called you to do. You come up out of that pit and you lean on the Father. That is what you have to do. You know what? We can say, we can say as Christians, look at us suffer. Look at us suffer. You know why? We want, we want atheists to look at us suffer because we suffer better. We suffer better because, and guess what else? We die better too. We die better. This book right here, you see this book right here? This is not a book of rules. This is not a book that tells you how to live. This is a book that tells you how to die. It is a love letter that tells you how to die. And every day, we are inwardly dying to the flesh, right? We need to be inwardly and outwardly dying to this world. That's what this book is for. That is what God is for. We lean on him to glorify his name. We suffer better. The gospel is the good news, for sure. But it's not the fake news, okay? So we don't need to be walking around, posting everywhere that, look at me, I'm a Christian and my life is so good. That's fake news. Your life is not so wonderful, okay? You still have struggles and it's okay. It's okay because you're going to lean on the Father and get up out of that pit. <sighs> the story of Lazarus. Mm, mm. The story of Lazarus in John. Uh, let's go to John 1, 11, Cain, please, or 11, 11, I'm sorry. So Lazarus had heard word, or Jesus had heard word that Lazarus had died, right? And so he's with his disciples, and he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Can you imagine? I, I just hold. I love this story. This is my favorite story about Jesus because it's so relational. He relates to uh, Mary, he relates to Martha, he relates to Lazarus, and he relates to us in this. So I want you to put your name where that is. Imagine Jesus, Jesus saying this to you. Our friend, Samantha, has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake her up. Our friend, Glenn, has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. Our friend, Sonny, has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake her her up. Jesus is so relational to the, in this, and he's telling his disciples, come on, let's go. And Thomas is like, okay, let's go. If we would die, if you die, we die. We're all going together. And so they head over there. And um, if you go to the very next verse for me, Cain, 
in John, you can do it. Yes. So first he sees Martha, and Martha comes out. She meets him at the gates, right, at the, at the edge of the village. And first Martha says, Lord, she says the same thing that Mary says right here, Lord, if only you had been here. If you had only been here, my brother would not have died. And this made Jesus a little angry. And he wasn't angry at Mary, and he wasn't angry at Martha. He was angry at sin. He was angry at what the enemy was trying to steal. He knew that there would be glory and death in the end, and he was angry about that. He felt all of these feelings just as man did, right? He wept. He wept because he was so heartbroken to see his friends heartbroken, but he was angry at the enemy. He was angry for what he was trying to steal from you, what he stole from us in the garden. He was angry about that. So when Mary comes out, so Martha goes back to the house, and Mary, they're sitting um, in Shiva. I think I said that correctly. I'm not, Andy, is that correct? Yes, good, thank you. Um, so they were sitting there and they sit low to the ground and Mary was in there and all the grieving people with her and Martha goes up to her and says, hey, this is what I love. She says, hey, the teacher, he wants to see you. He, she whispers it in his ear. Can you imagine if the teacher said he wants to see you? Yes, okay, let's go right now. See how relational he is, how he's getting down to everyone's level, and he's saying, I just want to see you. I just want to talk to you. I just want to have your ear. I just want to walk with you through this. And so Mary goes out, and she says, Lord. She's a little more distraught than Martha was. And she says, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And don't we feel like that sometimes? Don't we feel like, Lord, if only you had been here, I wouldn't have been abused. Lord, if only you had been here, my child wouldn't have done this. Lord, if only you had shown up when I asked you to show up four days ago. Lord, if only you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. My marriage wouldn't have failed. If only you had been here. But guess what? He was there. He's waiting. He's waiting for the right time to come to you and turn it all around so that you can glorify him with the miracle that he is about to perform. So if we go to the next part, right there. This is, this is the, the kid's favorite verse right here. Here it is. I almost just titled this whole thing, Jesus Wept. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? And Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across his entrance. He was still angry because sin is still bothering his people. It's still bothering the people that he loved. Roll the stone aside, he, so he told them. So inside these tombs, right, there are shelves, there's shelves, and you can fit like a whole family in there. They make a shelf for you to put the bodies on. And then in a year, they go in, and they take the, bo the bones that are left, and they put them in these boxes, and they put these boxes up on the shelves, and that's how these whole entire families get buried together. The boxes are called ossuaries. I believe that is how you say that. And so the, he's like, roll the stone away. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days, the smell will be terrible. Guess what? Jesus can take away the stink before your miracle. He can take it all away. So sometimes we're nervous about people finding out what we did, what happened, what the state of our being is, or, or of our mind, or of our family, or of our home, or whatever it is. But Jesus can take all of that away. Do not be scared to show Jesus the healing that you need. Like Pastor Jen said last week, what is uncovered can't be healed. What is, what is covered cannot be healed. You have to uncover it. So Martha, she said, even though she believed that, yes, Jesus is the life and the resurrection, she said, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible because after four days, it starts to stink a little bit. It's, just, it's not a good situation. But Jesus responded, responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they would believe you sent me. Jesus, God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, 
is allowing you to suffer out loud for the sake of all of the people watching you, watching you lean on him, right? Because we suffer better. We suffer better. We can suffer with joy. We can suffer with praise. We can suffer with peace. We suffer better. So that is why he said, he's praying out loud. He's like, Father, I know you hear me, but I'm just saying this out loud for the sake of all these people so they will believe that you sent me. Then Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. Can you imagine if he had just said, come out, how many dead people would have got up and walked on out of that tomb? He said, Lazarus, he called him by name, come out, just like he's calling you by name. Come out, Beth, come out, Nicole, come out, come up out of your tomb. And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound in grave cloths, and his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, okay. Jesus did not say, I'm going to go unwrap him. He told them, he told the people, the people that were to believe to go and unwrap him and let him out. Don't let that man suffer bounded up. If you have uh, the means to do something, you go and unwrap him. You help your friend that's in the pit. You know what? Sometimes I think that we get in these circumstances and we bury ourselves and we bury ourselves and then we forget like sometimes we're in this pit And there's a person in the pit next to us. They're right there. And we can help them. We might not be able to physically help them, but we can talk them through it. We can encourage them. We can reach out to them. That's why Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Let him go. It is on us to, one, show people how well we suffer. For two, to help them to help unwrap them and let them go. And I don't know if that means for you that you need to let go of the unforgiveness in your heart towards them. I don't even know if that means that you need to let go for that hate that you have towards them or that confusion or whatever it is, but you are to let them go. Help them in that way. Help them in that way. <sighs> Y'all. Woo, I'm just, I'm just getting started here. <laughs> and I'm a little sweaty, and it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I'm thinking back. I'm thinking back to this woman, this woman named Pam Bales. So October 17th, before 8 a.m., she planned a six-hour hike through New Hampshire's Mount Washington State Park. Anybody ever been to Mount, there, oh, look at that. That is this beautiful, she was a nurse. She was a, um, also a search and rescue team member. So she was experienced. She knew what she was doing. And she got up in the morning and she said, hey, I'm headed out. I'm going on this hike. I do this every year. It's gonna be great. Don't worry about me. She was prepared. She was prepared. She had extra clothes, right? She had um, everything in her backpack that you could think of. She had um, her plans. She left them on the dashboard of her at Nissan Xterra. And she um, also gave extra plans to volunteer rescue workers just in case she got lost, just in case something happened, alternative plans, all of this. She was prepared. So she heads up this, um, this Mount Washington and she gets towards the top, and it gets kind of crazy, right? The wind gusts of up to 231 miles per hour. And she thought, okay, well, I guess I'm going to take my other route back. I'm, I'm done. I'm not going all the way up. I'm going to take the other route back down this mountain. And she starts to trek back, but she notices. She notices on the ground there are these footprints. And she thought, well, there's no one else up here. So what, what's going on? And then she notices that they're sneaker footprints. They are not boot footprints. And she thought, sneakers up here like this, that's not wise. You know, it's cold. So she said, okay, I'm gonna, just going to start yelling out. So she starts yelling out, screaming, is anybody up here? Where are you? I can help you. Um, and she comes upon this man. And this man is sitting on the edge of this this summit area where she is. And he is dressed in shorts, okay, and sneakers, and he's very lethargic. And so at this point, her search and rescue nurse 
instincts, they kick in, right? And she's like, okay, sir, um, how did you get up here? And he's not really answering her. So she gets him to a, like a little bit of a safer place. And she, you know, strips him down, gets out her warmers that she has, puts it on his bare skin. You know, those hand warmers, those foot warmers. She warms him up. She gives him her clothes, her clothes that she had in her back in case, I mean, and it's crazy up there. Kane, can we have a picture of what it looked like from the observatory? That's what it looked like by that time. And she's getting scared, and she knows that she has to move fast, and she's asking him his name, and he's not telling her his name. And she's so, okay, so we're going to, you're going to have to stay, I'm going to call you John. I'm going to call you John. She's like, stay right on me, John. Like, and he's barely with it. She's singing Elvis songs to him. She's walking with him. She's saying, stay right on me, John. And she had to be a little forceful with her language because, she had to wake him up, you know, as, we're, I'm on a platform, I'm not going to repeat it. But she had to keep him, she had to keep his attention, right? And so she's going and she's going and she's like, stay on me. He's coming in and out, but he's walking. He's wearing her clothes and he's walking. And they get down to the bottom. Finally, he gets in his car and he leaves. And a month later, she is never heard from him again, right? She didn't even know if John was his real name. That is just what she was calling him. She was just calling him John. A month later, her search and rescue team, which is where she volunteered for, received this letter. He said, I went up Mount Jewel to end my life. He stated, recounting how she had discovered him the entire time. She treated me with compassion authority, confidence, and the impression that I mattered. With all that's been going wrong in my life, I, it, I didn't matter to me. But I did to Pam. She probably thought I was the stupidest hiker dressed like I was, but I was never put down in any way. Chewed out, yes, yes, in a kind way. Maybe I wasn't meant to die yet, and somehow I knew that I still mattered in life. So that is how, when your circumstances are bad and you're already buried, she was already buried. I mean, she was already in a very bad situation. She was already suffering, right? But she showed up. She showed how to suffer well. She showed how to suffer better. She put down her life to save his life, right? And that's all that Jesus has done for us. He put down his life to save our life, to resurrect us, In the name of Jesus, thank you, Jesus, for resurrecting us, that we can suffer better, that we can die better, right? She never revealed who he was to the media. And and I found out they just made a movie about this. Ah, ha, ha. And you can, why? I'm not going to recommend it from the platform because I don't know the language, but (laughs) see me afterwards and I'll tell you. Um, But they just made a movie about this and it's, It's amazing because she never still, even with the movie being made, has not even revealed because it wasn't for her glory. It wasn't, she wasn't making it about her. She wasn't making the burial that she was in, the story about, oh, look what I did to save this man. No, she was making it about him. She was making it about Jesus because that is what happened, that he came so that we could die better. We could suffer better. And so when Paul says, if you put back, 12.9, please, Cain. When Paul says, in my weaknesses, I am made stronger. Your power is made perfect in my weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Y'all, we need to start boasting all the more gladly about our weaknesses. Because otherwise, this Christianity thing we're doing, it's just fake news. It's just fake news. Your, your life is not that amazing. You're not that amazing. You're still a sinner saved by grace, just like those atheists out there all have the chance to be. And if we don't start boasting more gladly about our weaknesses, being more honest, being more transparent about the things that we struggle with that Christ has saved us from and is still saving us from every single day, then we are doing him a disservice. We are doing this faith a disservice, and we might as well just stop showing up on Sunday morning because, I don't know, we just might as well just stop showing up just to have a little party here. That's not what we're here for, guys. We are here for so that they may know the glory that awaits them when they fall into the arms of Jesus and just suffer, just suffer. So if my worship team would come on up, 
and my prayer team would join them. And if there's anyone, I, you know, I want to say something first. This song that we're doing right now, I requested this song because we sang it at Thrive, and I've been hearing it on the radio for, I don't know, it's been like a year. And it says, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Yes. We leave everything at his feet. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we can just leave everything, every single thing at your feet, Lord Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing us how to suffer better, how to suffer with peace, and how to suffer with joy. Lord Jesus, if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you, if there's anyone in here that doesn't know Jesus, repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I love you. I want to know you better. I want to suffer better, Lord Jesus. I believe that you died for me, and I believe that you're coming back again. I believe I'm a sinner saved by only you. Only you can make me clean, Lord Jesus. And I give my life to you right now, Lord Jesus. I give my life to you. I want to suffer better. I want to die better. I want to be better so that others can know you, Jesus. I want to be better. I want to see others come alive in your name. Not in my name. Not in the name of the church, Lord Jesus. In your name. Because you are the only one can fix what's broken. You're the only one that can call us out of that tomb, Lord Jesus. You're the only one that can help us out of that grave. Lord Jesus, there's so many in here that matter right now. There's so many hearts in our lives, people in our lives, family members that matter, Lord Jesus. And they don't know you yet, Lord. Lord, I just, right now on this sanctuary, Lord, I just ask that you would put it on people's hearts to come up to these altars and pray for those people that are lost. Pray for those lost family members. Pray for those people that don't know you yet, the people who are breaking your heart every day, Lord Jesus, and they're breaking their family's heart because they're breaking your heart. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would just call these people up to stand in the gap for their family and just pray. Just pray for them, Lord Jesus. We know that when two or three are gathered in your name, Lord, you are there in the midst of them. So right now we lift up every family member, every single family member, Lord Jesus, that does not know you. We lift them up to you, Lord. We lift them up to you and that you would draw them closer to you, that you would speak to them in a way that they recognize, Lord. You would speak to them. You would give them a sign. You would give them a nudge that you would tug on their hearts, that you would turn their faces towards you. Lord, we are desperate for you. We are desperate to come alive in the name of Jesus. Our worship team is going to play the song. Our prayer team is here, and they're here for you. And you don't have to get out of your seats. And you, you don't even have to. You can just turn around. You can make an altar at your chair. Or you can come up to these altars. I don't know if you were here last week, and Miss Andy explained. There is power here at these altars. This is where lives are changed, right here at these altars. You don't have to rush out. You can just worship them for your, from your seat. But I hope that you do press in. I hope that you do press into the joy and the peace and the love and the healing that he has for you and your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Our time and offering verse for today comes from Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. So when we take the time to honor God for what he has already provided for us, the Bible tells us that he's going to continue to provide for us. It's going to be bursting at the seams and he takes care of us no matter what's going on in our lives. And I just want to encourage you, you can give five different ways. There's tithing online. There's texting to give. You can also give your tithe and offering in the boxes as you leave outside of the foyer today. And we just want to tell you how much we appreciate your giving and your faithfulness and that God takes notice of that giving and faithfulness too. And so we love you and thank you so much. Hello, River Life Church. This is Pastor Cliff and my wife Cheryl. We're your visitation pastors, and we'd like to take this opportunity to encourage you to contact us if you have anything. It doesn't matter if it's serious, you just need somebody to talk to, 
you know, anything that you have that you you just need somebody to, to vent to, give us a call. Our number is in the bulletin. God bless you. Church, we want to thank our serve team for serving at the fall festival today at the Little League Field. Thank you, thank you for serving with us. We love to serve our community, right? 